Yes, I said the second scientific and industrial revolutions. And I'm going to start where, so where I ended last time when I talked about sort of when we talked about the impact of science on this first industrial revolution. Where basically one view is basically that science has very little direct influence on the second and on the first industrial revolution. Uh, there was no really not, not very many scientists involved, not, not very many sort of particularly clear scientific theories or experiments. But then there's the other view saying, well, actually, there's some indirect links there, which you describe often as sort of the industrial enlightenment or the more the heritage of, so, of Newton and Bacon, so the Baconian Newtonian heritage. And these are so sort of three main heritage. One is first the scientific method method of detail, which basically is about focus on accurate measurements and controlled experiments or insistence of reproducibility and uh, to make also knowledge publicly available and communicated freely, which of course with the scientific revolution comes in terms of that you're publishing scientific, now we would describe them as scientific articles in some scientific journals and so on, that uh, there's a term saying now that information wants to be free. And in some ways, I mean, that's sort of part of this sort of the scientific heritage, that information or scientific results want to be free. Scientific communication should be open. Even though, of course, in practice, I mean, you also see, of course, a lot of scientists keeping on their whatever they work and not really want to discuss their research un until when they are done, when they have sort of discovered whatever they want to discover. So even though it's said that sort of information and science want to be free, there's also stages there that some parts you don't want to discuss it. The other part is scientific mentality, which is more sort of a wider, elusive sense that you're more like about the worldview, the Newtonian worldview. Basically, that we can understand the world as being ordered, orderly, and in some ways also predictable, following sort of predictable mechanisms. That sort of we can understand the world in the sense that there are mechanisms out there that sort of are guiding, that sort of regulating how things are done. A mechanistic worldview. Uh, and also that there are sort of knowable and controllable natural laws out there, laws that we can discover and, sort of, and find out about. And that way also sort of then also goes back to sort of also looking at sort of the industrial world and machines, that also machines are guided along sort of uh, mechanical laws. But of course, even though the craftsmen, of course, have known this for centuries and decades and millennia in a way, that of course there are principles there that you can do. Rule of thumb is also a term that's been used way before sort of industrial revolution. But it's not in a sense, it's more like rules or sort of guidelines rather than you, you see it sort of following some kind of laws or system in that sense. So a systematic worldview, uh, that things are guided according to systematic principles. And also that natural phenomena and mankind's artificial works are subject to the same law. So that's basically the same idea that sort of the nature and man-made things are all following the same laws, basically, uh, in the end. Increasing use of mathematics and engineering and technology, belief that systematic experimentation would lead to improved machinery. That's also the sort of principles or uh, sort of larger worldview mentality. And then the last part was about scientific culture or the Baconian ideology. That basically, in a way, that science has a larger role out in society. Uh, that science, which is especially from uh, Francis Bacon, that is in the service of commercial interest. Science should be used sort of to make sort of profit in one way or another. Uh, and also in, in connected to this, that's also sort of like a constant improvement in technology. That, that sort of be, should be a guiding principle, that we should sort of constantly improve technology. And then also connected to what's been described sometimes as invisible colleges, that there should be an increased sort of interaction between scientists and, and practical men, engineers, craftsmen. Uh, so informal exchange networks of, of knowledge. Uh, and one example there from the industrial revolution is called Lunar Society, which I believe was in, located in Birmingham, where you had a number of industrialists that were meeting with natural philosophers and discussing sort of issues of general and common interest. <coughs> but basically, overall, so that systematic knowledge became more accessible. That was sort of, in some ways, the outflow of the sort of in, impact. But once again, these are indirect uh, sort of impacts. Uh, links. This is not like directly, once again, it's very rare to see a scientist working on developing new kind of technologies or working sort of in a laboratory to try to develop a specific working thing, or at least succeeding in developing a, a sort of a functional commercial thing, innovation. Okay, so, so that was sort of, a, once again, the connection between science and technology. So now what I'll first talk about now is sort of what's been described as the second scientific revolution which goes from 1789, French Revolution, until 1950s or so. Uh, but I'm going to focus on, for this uh, lecture and 
the one on Wednesday, is about the first revolutionary phase, which is basically from 1789 to 1869, roughly. And basically, so this is once again the old, uh, before this period, we have then a sort of a new natural philosophy being developed during the first scientific revolution, uh, sort of where they have sort of mathematized traditional sciences, astronomy, optics, mechanics. They are now sort of being sort of applying mathematics to try to understand these traditional sciences better. Uh, and also what, the, what they describe as the new Baconian sciences, the study of heat, electricity, magnetism, and chemistry. These are sort of starting in this period already. And then the, the large third important point was that the science has a new political public institution, which is seen partly also by the setting up of number of new national academy. Royal Society in England is uh, well known. Acad Académie de Sciences uh, in France is also well known. Societies where, sort of, where, where sci natural philosophers, scientists are meeting to discuss the general question, often by the support of the state also at this time. But basically then, so then talk about what's happening during the second scientific revolution is that Science is changing in scale, scope, and structure. And scope, in the sense, is going from natural philosophy to sciences. And he, here we see some of the sort of the changes happening in this period. An increasing mathematization or quantifying of the Baconian sciences, heat, electricity, magnetism, and also chemistry. And I'm more chemistry in blue here because I'm going to talk a bit more about that specifically soon. And also mathematical physics is sort of coming. What we today would describe as theoretical physics is sort of being developed this time, or at least physics where you're using a lot of math sort of to uh, understand things, not just experiments. Uh, specialization, we see new sciences coming at this time. Chemistry once again, uh, geology, biology, and physiology are new sciences. Chemistry, of course, have existed before this, but it's during this period that when it becomes disciplined, in a sense, in, into a more formalized science. Instrumentation, we see also a number of new instruments being used much more sort of within the sciences, and also concepts, uh, theoretical or uh, concepts. Instruments, of course, I mean, one of the prime instruments we talked about in the first Industrial Revolution, at least I mentioned in the first Scientific Revolution, is of course the telescope. That's one of these new instruments. You could have added also the microscope. Uh, Robert Hooke in England was one of the first actually using a microscope to look sort of at the natural world and discovering all these sort of small animals living around us everywhere that no one had seen before, of course, before the microscope. Um, but now a number of sort of increased instruments are coming in and sort of and helping scientists to, to understand the world clearer and better. Uh, but then also new concepts are coming in this time. Atoms, of course, I mean, all Democritus, the uh, ancient philosopher, talked about atoms. But this is the first time when atoms are actually seen as a tool to understand the world, and actually a tool that you actually can use in calculations uh, and sort of to, and to operationalize, so to speak. Energy. It becomes a tool in itself, following sort of thermodynamics. And evolution is also one of these concepts, of course, with Darwin sort of being launched, which is a new way of understanding uh, the world, understanding how we are and where we are, what we are and how we are, where we are also. Okay, scale. It's also sort of, it, it's expanding its geographic focus. The first, industrial, first scientific revolution is primarily focused on Italy, you can say, and England in this sense, Bacon, Newton, and so on in England, of course, with um, Galileo and uh, Copernicus to some degree. Uh, but now, especially see France and Germany becomes new sort of centers, and later on also during sort of the later phase of the Second Industrial Revolution, especially the U.S. becomes one of the powerhouses, of course, of science uh, in the before the Second World War, but also during the Second World War and after, of course. Uh, you also see a growth of communities of scientists, so the scale of the scientific communities is increasing. More, you see more and more people working in science and working on science. Uh, and then the structure is also changing. The structure of science is also changing during this period in the sense that you have an institu institutionalization going on in the sense that you see a number of new research institutes, you see specialized associations of, of, of scientists. And the Association of Advancement of Science, I believe, is set up in the early 19th century. Specialized journals, scientific journals. I mean, we already had one of the first with the Royal Society, the transactions of the Royal Society going back to the 17th century. But now we see that more and more, in more and more fields, you have specialized journals where scientists are sort of communicating with each other, writing what we today describe as research articles, scientific articles, uh, which is starting off sort of the beginning is then basically that scientists are exchanging letters with each other. And then these letters are actually then being published. Uh, because they want to give a wider spread, because they think that what they're talking about in these letters are so generally interesting, so they want other scientists to take part in this. And that's sort of the beginning, you can say, of the scientific journals. Uh, and then you have also professionalization. Uh, once again, that scientists are then sort of 
becoming, it becomes a profession to be a scientist. It's not something that you do on the side. It's not a hobby, even though many still are sort of doing science as a hobby. Uh, sort of while they're being a priest or while they're being a, a university teacher or while they're being a, a sort of a, um, a wealthy a gentleman, they stay and do science on the side. And there are many sort of important discoveries and many important developments are coming from these people. But during this period, you see more and more people so that, that, that their primary profession is to be a scientist, which often, of course, includes teaching into that also. But we see also a number of the the, the rise of the research university and also connect to this the rise of the teaching laboratory which is one of these institutions within the research university how science and scientific work is being disseminated to students uh, and then we also see sort of a big wave of sort of of trying to sort of give the public the general public sort of scientific education this is what we today would be described as popular science in the 19th century especially, also in the 18th century, we see a big wave of sort of scientists going out and sort of giving popular lectures or giving lectures about sort of science, to try to educate the, the public in general about science and how science works. Not something we don't see so much anymore. We still have sort of these open universities, so I mean, which in a way is a sense of this, but you can say there was much more, had a larger place in society, you can say, in the 19th century than it has today. And also connected to this about the professional station, that is the idea that which comes with the idea of profession, that scientists have an ideal uh, to serve society. Not just that they, they, what they, they should do what they do just because they think it's interesting and fun for themselves, but they also have some, a larger sort of service to fulfill, to sort of benefit mankind, sort of to provide the services for the greater good. That sort of comes with the idea of that belonging to a profession that has kind of special uh, cause. Application. Uh, also, then, once again, that the idea also coming partly from uh, Francis Bacon. Uh, talk about here somewhere. Anyway, that actually that you should sort of science should be applied for practical matters. Industrial research is one of these aspects. We'll talk more about uh, next week. And also, as it becomes associated to societal progress, so that, that is part of sort of science role to help out and make society progress. Uh, scientists. There's also a big belief at this time uh, that actually that we can interpret everything that's happening in the world according to, according to scientific principles. We can apply sort of the scientific method in one, if, or the scientific worldview to other areas outside of life. Uh, social uh, Darwinism is one example of this, uh, but it's sort of taking the theory of evolution in some ways and applying this to sort of how countries progress or how countries should progress, and maybe even how we should sort of try to progress as individuals. And that also leads to the connection about eugenics and that we should try to improve ourselves through breeding, not just breeding as we've been doing with animals to breed animals. We should now also start to think about breeding sort of humans or at least sort of selection of who should be sort of given uh, for, uh, given support to uh, procreate. So the, the big, so basically the view of science is that it's spreading in many, many, many areas. Um, and then also part of this application that God's place is also now starting to be threatened. I mean, Darwinism is one example of this. When it's seen actually that science now is influencing that actually sort of the, the place and location of God in the general sort of for some, not for everyone, of course. We have many examples then and now, of course, where scientists are faithful, I mean, they believe in God, they have no problem combining science and religion in that sense. Uh, but overall, you can see there's much more discussion about sort of now, sort of, is, it, is science threatening uh, God or is threatening um, God's place in society? And the last part then about popularization, which I also talked about sort of somewhat before here, that now we have a sort of a gaining a large public audience for science. Scientists are giving popular lectures in many ways. Uh, there are popularized versions of various of the scientific works being read and, and also once again evolution is a good example where actually that's discussed in the general field as, and also you see various sort of popular popularizations and popular versions of these theories. Abandonment of anonymity. Uh, that scientists now not sort of they become known. They become also in some ways sort of public heroes or maybe even celebrities in many ways. And so the notion of scientific genius is coined. And of course, one of the foremost ones, Newton, of course, already, but then later on, of course, people like Einstein, Marie Curie, and others have been, been seen as sort of, as sort of celebrities uh, in their right as being scientists. Okay, so what I talk about here is how science has changed. But the first, before I do that, I want to talk about uh, a lot of things are happening in France. You can see a number of these developments is happening in France. And one development that sort of has been already going on, but is sort of getting a new 
you can say, enforcement during this period is the engineer. I mean, it is during this period, from the sort of uh, industrial, first industrial revolution, but also during this new sort of new scientific revolution and the second industrial revolution, that the engineer is really coming out and becoming a more sort of recognizable figure than before. Here we see one of the most famous engineers uh, in the history of technology, Isabel Kingdom Brunel, standing in front of his, the ship he's been designing, the great uh, eastern ship, and the, the, the chains here are the chains sort of for the anchors for, for the ship there. Uh, and what, what you see in this period is that basically the engineer is going through a change from basically being a very more sort of crafts and focus and practical uh, man of there is own, I, thought, I don't re really know any women being engineers at this time. I mean, you could count Ada Lovelace in a way as, a, as an engineer, but, but it's a very different kind of engineer. She's focusing, of course, on early computers and uh, whatever. But nevertheless, the engineers are men overall at this time. Uh, and so the, but they're going it through a, a change here, going basically from local craftsmen where they have the, really no clear distinction between engineers and mechanics, uh, when there's a lot of craft knowledge sort of it's guiding sort of how their, their knowledge and their skills. Local ingenuity, hands-on experience, uh, and, and sort of their knowledge is sort of non-generalized, but very specific, something you learn on the job, often connected to a very specific kind of practice, not the sort of some skills that you can apply in other areas, which of course today, as in, in engineering school, you learn a lot of sort of general skills that are applicable to many different kinds of fields. I mean, most likely, what you're training for now, maybe in engineering school, you're going to use that maybe for the first, I don't know, five years of your career, and then you're probably going to move into some other area which you haven't learned in engineering school. But you're still going to be able to do that, hopefully, in a very good way, because you will learn some more generalizable skills about how to think and how to operate with technology. But this is not really what's happening at this time. And there is, of course, and the training also of this older kind of engineers through apprenticeship, practical indenture and pupillage. So basically, you didn't go to engineering schools at this time, before the 19th century. You went and found sort of a, a skilled engineer and you worked with him as his, or his apprentice and then you sort of, you learned the craft that way. And also at this part time, during the industrial period especially, it's about entrepreneurs. Engineers are sort of working as entrepreneurs, self-made men often. They're not working for some large companies, which of course often the, the model nowadays. I mean, the, the large companies are coming during the 19th century especially. But basically at this time, the engineers are project managers, we may would describe them today, or project leaders of some large industrial project. And there are not as many then, as, of course, as now. As now. But, once, but during the Industrial Revolution, the hero engineer becomes sort of made into the hero industrial revolution. And especially one person called Samuel Smiles, and he started to write books about these engineers. One famous uh, series of books is The Lives of the Engineers, when it describes the lives of James Watt or Isabel King Brunel and other engineers, James Arkwright and others. We sort of celebrates them and sort of, and it's, it's also a lot about the morals there. They are described as very sort of upstanding men and sort of having these grand visions uh, and so on and so forth. So they've been made into sort of very heroic uh, figures. Industrial biography is also a similar kind of work. So, so for me as an historian of technology, this is in a way sort of the starting point of my discipline, the history of technology, although once again, this is one of the, Samuel Smiles was not a professional historian in that sense. He was sort of doing this because he felt that this was a very important and worthy thing to celebrate. So that's the beginning of history of technology. But also, so there's a lot of these sort of the engineers has been celebrated as hero, and this even describes sort of the kind of heroic materialism. We have large bridges, canals, ships like the Great Eastern, railways, and so they're also then sort of celebrated. And here we see one of these bridges uh, built for this, uh, and railway bridge built, as it said here, Isabel Kingdom Brunel, I.K. Brunel, engineer, 1869, I believe this, so it's 59. So basically, once again, so like the, once again, celebrated how they, these engineers are remaking nature, remaking the natural world uh, in, with these sort of often very grand projects, canals, railways, bridges. But as I said, this is a change happening this time because and this is sort of when the engineers going through from craftsmen to professionals, and this is very much happening in, in France, or a lot of the, what's happening in France is be, being very influential on what's happening in other areas. And this is very much connected also to science, or at least the view on science, that science is an important part of engineering, or should be an important part of engineering. 
The civil engineer, began, so the birth of the civil engineer starts in France in the 1700s. Uh, and it starts off with a number of different engineering corps. First, very much connected to military matters, because before this period, engineer is primarily a person working on military machines, military engines, working on military matters. It is during this period when you see a number of sort of civil engineers, in the sense that engineers working on non-military matters. But then once again, it starts off coming from the military. So in 1675, the first sort of engineering corps set up, Corps d'Engineurs du Génie Militaire, which was an engineering officer's corps. Then in 1716, you have another one, Corps de pont de Chaussée, the core of, uh, of um, bridges and roads. Uh, and then, it's once again, a civil engineering corps. Uh, it's going out of the military, but now starting focusing on civil, uh, civilian matters. So basically that engineers should then serve the state, very much so. So they help the state to improve especially their infrastructure and transportation system. This set up with the Ministry of France and was the main point to improve France's sort of transportation system. Then in 1783, you have sort of Corp de Mine, which is based focusing on mining and the iron industry, the other large sort of industrial sector during the 18th century. Um, and then what's coming with this, what's coming with this new course is actually also one a view sort of that science, this engineering should be more scientific. And that's also because it's very much connected to France, which have this sort of tradition, you can say, a focus on, sort of, especially on the role of mathematics and this, the importance of mathematics. You see a number of works, both in French and later on in German, sort of focusing, trying to sort of mathematize, you can say, engineering or systematize engineering. And then you have one of the first engineering schools, uh, 1747, Ecole de pont de chaussee connected to the Corps de pont de chaussee in some ways to, to train these people that are then going to work in this engineering course. And then in 1794, Ecole Polytechnique, which is one of the most well-known engineering school overall. And the interesting thing here is once again connected to sort of the, the first industrial revolution, that this was a way to reduce uh, the United Kingdom's leading position in industry. Uh, it was seen as a threat, sort of the, the, the big industrial might being developed in, in the UK. So it was seen as sort of they should sort of try to counter that in some way. And one way was setting up this engineering corps. And here you see some of the students that they called Polytechnique. And once again, here we see sort of the connection to the military, because if you were a student at Ecole Polytechnique, you were also an officer student. You were trained as an engineer, but you were also trained as an officer. But also the important part about Ecole Polytechnique is that it has a substantial scientific component in, uh, Ecole, uh, in the training at Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, that was basically focusing a lot on math and physics and chemistry, and this, because that was seen as very important uh, for the engineer. And then what you see is gradually sort of transformation from engineering from a craft to a profession. And the real professionalization of engineering is then coming in the, during the 19th century, uh, starting already sort of in, in the early 18th century, or late 18th century, when we have see one of the first societies for engineers, a group only for engineers, so to speak, the Society of Civil Engineers. And once again, here we see the role of England, because this is set up in England. Uh, and so these are sort of one of the first things that is characteristic of a profession. Uh, when you think of professions, I mean, you have professions like priests, lawyers, doctors, engineers and teachers, these are generally seen as the professions. And a profession has sort of a specialized knowledge, they have some knowledge that others don't have, that they sort of have acquired during a long period of training. And this sort of, their belonging to the profession is certified by some kind of, in some way certified through engineers by going through an engineering school graduation. Uh, and then the last, one important last part of being part of a profession is that you see that you have a responsibility to serve a larger pu public good. I mean, once again, thinking of doctors, their duty is to serve their patients. Uh, priests, of course, once again, their duty is, not, is to serve sort of the, the parishioners. Uh, lawyers serve their clients. And then engineers, and that they should serve sort of a larger sort of group, not just their employers, even though there's often a tension there between sort of, especially in engineering, who they should have loyalty towards, their employers or to their customers or users of their things in a way. Once again, systematic knowledge is an important part of this, specialized knowledge, theoretical approach to technology been developed here, also spreading into other countries. In 1827, you have in the US, you have a book, Elements of Technology, one of the first time that the term technology is actually used. Also in German, Handbuch der Ingenieurswissenschaft, so engineering science is starting to be defined here. So we're starting, once again, a more systematic view about this technology and engineering. Uh, you have a number of institutional engineers, these are the which is more or less a private club society now sort of becomes sort of widening into more specific institutions. You have the first of these, the Institute of Civil Engineers, but then in 1848, 
actually there's another group of engineers that sort of claim basically that they are different from these civil engineers. They are in some ways civil engineers, but they're not doing different civil engineering things. They're working on mechanical issues. Because civil engineers at this time was not just as it is today, sort of roads and um, and bridges and things. There were sort of all kinds of things. But then from the 1840s, there, there's a group within these civil engineers that, that think that they are different actually. They're not doing exactly, they don't have the same interests that these mechanical engineers. And then you have a number of engineering schools that have been set up outside of France. West Point in 1802, military, can be one of the first engineering schools in the US. Here in Finland, you have the Polytechnic School of Helsinki, first set up in 1849, and then reaching more or less university status in the 1870s. Okay, so that's a startup in a way, what we're going to talk about next time. But next time, we're going to talk more about the scientific revolution also. Oops. But your take home assignments for next time. We already had talked about this, about the role of electricity, but now I want, because that's one of the big important sort of development during the second industrial revolution, also during the second uh, scientific revolution. So I want you to start thinking about sort of what's the role of electricity today. So the first part, explain what things you have on yourself, on your person that is powered by electricity. And the second part of the question, explain what machines you have in your home that is not powered by electricity. Okay? Once again, to try to make you think through what's the role of electricity in your lives today, what has it been? And then, of course, then you can also think about what would the world be without electricity. Motivate to support your answers and explain how you have defined machine. Okay? Questions, comments? If not, see you on Wednesday. <laughs>